My guest today is a 23-year-old mixed martial artist from New York, early in his professional career with a record of three wins and two losses, two coming from split decisions, and he was previously ranked as number one in New York as an amateur in karate. Welcome, Harveer Singh. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I like the intro too, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, man, no worries. Um, yeah. So what I like to do at the beginning is just take it right back to you growing up as a kid. So what was so, it like growing up as a, a kid in New York? Well, um, is it cool if my daughter sits on my lap really quick? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, cool. Hey, all right, she's, she's trying to. But um, <laughs> she, might, she might come over here no at worries. some point. But um, as a kid, I mean, I feel like one of the biggest struggles for me as a kid was just moving around a lot. I just, I moved around. I was never in the same school for more than like two years until high school. High school, I was in the same high school. But um, but yeah, my childhood was pretty good. Otherwise, um, I moved around a lot. So I had a lot, I knew a lot of people. Uh, I was the only child till I was nine. Um, I had a little sister. It's like my sister daughter. Cause my dad ended up leaving like around like when I was like around 13, like 13, 14. So, like, I, this is my first daughter, but I, I, I feel like I have, I had two practice daughters before this one. Baby sisters. Yeah, yeah, my baby sisters. But I was always, um, I was always active. I've been fighting since, like, like, competitively since I was six years old. I've been competing, um, like, uh, not full contact, but semi-contact rules. Yeah. This baby. So, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Over here. <laughs> yeah, this is my baby. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I was always um I feel like when it comes to like sports, I was always training hard. I, I feel like the intensity was always the same compared to like now from when I was a kid, which is probably why I did like I was I was pretty like I'm not like boasting, but I was pretty good as like, a child, like growing up. Like I was ranked number one in New York. I feel like that's just because of the hard work I always put in. But um oh yeah, that's pretty much like a rough like like my childhood in the shell. Yeah. When you were moving around, were you always like in New York or were you going from like So I started so when I was like a baby, I was born in New York and then I moved to Wisconsin till I was like around two. Then I came back and then I was just back and forth a lot of um between like Richmond Hill and uh in like Queens Village, parts of uh, Queens. I'm, I don't know if you know them. Do you know about Richmond Hill? I, th I think uh, that's, you mentioned when we were speaking, is that the place that's like recently got changed to ben Punjab Avenue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's the okay. So that's I'm like- guessing there's a lot of Punjabi uh, people there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like little Punjab and like little Guyana. So like, there's yeah. just a whole bunch of Guyanese people, a whole bunch of Punjabi people. But yeah, so I was back and forth between between Richmond Hill and Queens Village a lot. Then for high school, we moved out to Long Island and I've been in Long Island ever since. Right. And speaking of um, little Guyana, your mom's from Guyana by way of Jamaica, right? Yeah, so she was, um, she was born in New York and then her parents actually sent her to Jamaica when she was like six months old. Okay. And then she came back to New York when she was like, like 11, 12. Right, like, okay. And then, yeah, but until then, she was living her whole life in, in Jamaica and the, on the island. What was that like? I mean, I've been to Jamaica a bunch of times, especially as a child. Yeah. So, um, Jamaica's really poor, but, like, naturally, it's, like, one of those kind of countries, but it has a lot of crime and, and whatever. But, but like, the people there are some of the most beautiful people. Like, the scenery is beautiful, the... The food is beautiful, and it was always funny, like, going to Jamaica, because out of the whole, like, little town, we were the only brown people. Like, everybody else was, like, you know, like, dark skin. Like, yeah, and yeah. Everybody, we were the only brown people. So you stood and, out. Uh, what did you say? So you stood out. Yeah, we stood out. I feel like it's always been like that, though, everywhere. Um, I go, you tired? Oh, my gosh, you tired. But, uh, <laughs> um... Well, yeah, but uh, even my family in Jamaica, like, uh, so we're actually part part Irish as well. So my family in Jamaica, like, they 
they celebrate certain Irish traditions. Like my great grandmother, she's she was half Irish and half Jamaican. She was like brown skin with green eyes. Yo, you know, that's looking, mad. Yeah, right. That's so we we've always been like that family. <laughs> There is, um, there is, I've heard like a lot of um, Irish Jamaican people. I don't know like if, what, why that link is there. Do you know why that link's there? I mean, it's probably something got to do with something with like slavery and like some type oh. of slave master, Irish or whatever, you know, like some type of cross. Cause I know that like, there was like Jamaica was a very, very big slave like island. They have like, when you go there, they have a lot of like, like, historical sites that were built by slaves or that like they have a lot of like superstition like a lot of curses on the island because the whole island was like like a pretty big slave island so wow. that's probably why that why uh, that was a thing probably like i don't know there was a lot of irish slave masters i don't know there was something, know. probably something along those lines i don't know for sure though yeah yeah, yeah. um and then as you were saying that you like you were stood out uh, uh, in Jamaica was like light skin. Um, when we were speaking in the lead up to this, you were saying that you went to like quite a segregated school and then you stood out for being like well brown, I guess. Uh, yeah. In that, so talk talk to me about that. Most definitely. So I feel like my whole life, yeah, I've been standing out. Like I feel like I mean, just from looking at me, you probably probably can tell I don't look like the average like Punjabi dude, like. I'm a little too dark. My hair's a little too curly. So to the into Punjabi people growing up, like I'm not saying anything, but kids are kids are savage sometimes. But I wasn't I wasn't necessarily Indian to the Indian kids. Mm. And then my skin is also too light, too fair. And then my hair's too thick for me to be a Caribbean kid. So and you're just caught in the, the middle. Time, yeah, at the same time, I'm definitely don't look black. Like <laughs> so yeah. I would definitely wasn't part of the, that group. So. You know, like, I feel like no matter where I went, it was always, like, an issue. But I feel I, I feel like that that never really was, like, a big problem for me. I had no problem, like, like you know, thinking. Like, I, I feel like I, I like thinking a lot or, like, expressing myself through, like, my own means. Like, I play a lot of video games always since I was a kid. Yeah, but when, yeah. I moved, um, when I moved over here to Long Island, I definitely felt it a lot more because... Uh, I don't know if you know about my area of Long Island. It's called Floor Park. And uh, okay, right, yeah. okay, so right, like let's say Floor Park is north, right? Like this is this is north, yeah. right? And then south is Elma, right here, right? They border each other. Right, so okay. we're actually the most segregated part of America by way of this border right here, right? So you go north of the border, and you have all where I live. You have all the uh, I'm just gonna be a little blunt, like a rich white, like, like you could think of like, like a Trump supporter. Like, there's a lot of Trump flags, like that, that kind of stereotype in the top, like the whole town. All yeah. like, they don't like, they don't like you if you're the little bit, littlest bit melanin. And it's not necessarily like they're gonna run you out of town, but okay. Real quick sidebar: the KKK had their first meeting in New York in my town. And the, their, ta their temple was actually like, this, they renamed it to Con Cen Centennial Hall. So just, oh, just okay. look at that. I've like, heard of that. Oh, you've heard of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So they um, just off of that, like, I guess you could kind of tell, like, that was only like, like 100 years ago when they first had their first meeting here. And so they, 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 they make their feelings known. Basically. yeah exactly and it's not necessarily like oh yeah we're kkk brother like nothing like that but it's like like going to school like you can see like a lot of times like the, like certain kids will have certain like mentalities that's not natural for a kid to have and it's like it's like i know racism wasn't taught in my school so you could only make the assumption that it's something that's taught at home but like yeah. when you come to school you would see like literally like segregated like they would only be like white kids who only talk to other white kids or kids that looked white, fair skin, like, and if anybody that was colored, like let's say myself, would try to come up to like a group or like whoever that was part of that stereo, the other stereotype, it would be like, a, like it would be too awkward. Like it would be like, oh, why is he here? Like, why are you here? Like, why are you talking to us? Like kind yeah, of yeah. that kind of thing. And then 
like you would see it a lot of times like unfortunately and like with the with the black kids in my school too like they would just they would just do their own thing live their life whatever and then a lot of times you would hear like a lot of like the white kids saying like oh why do you laugh like a monkey like why are you oh. look so big like why do you why do you look like that like you're so dark like you know like there's little things blatant like that racism like blatant like you could tell like it's not necessarily saying like black is worse but you could tell like that type of mentality is not natural like it clearly was like something like outside of school taught them that yeah and, yeah at home and stuff. That, that type of mentality is really common in Pool park because i've been like again i've grown up in a lot of places in new york mm-hmm. like just new york period like and then even still, like, I still go, I travel out east to Long Island. I, I'll go all throughout the boroughs. I'm a personal trainer, so I'm in a lot of the different boroughs a lot. But, um, yeah, you don't really see it, like, how it is in Flow Park. Like, again, like, the border issue, the top is uh, the people that I've been explaining so far. And then the bottom would be, like, like the bottom is Hempstead. Is like, the town. It's called Hempstead. Yeah, but yeah. The, Specifically, the town is Elmont, and in that on that border, traveling, like starting from Elmont, and for the rest of, like maybe like, like ten miles, has like one of the highest rates of opioid related crimes in the country. Oh well, wow. you see, like that's just like a very big, drastic difference. Big, and it, big change. It literally, yeah. like you could literally see the line. You can go up to the line, like and see right where it turns from. Oh yeah, there's little five year olds walking outside the school, the three year olds like walking with their other four year old friends where they can do that. Yeah. And when you cross the line, like you just there are no kids outside. Like there's like the part of Elmont that I'm right by is it used to be like the number one homicide rate in New York. Like, Definitely. You know, and it, it's kind of spooky because like, how do these two things like exist literally touching each other? but yeah that's crazy that yeah. is a, that's way 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 close yeah way close and it's like many times i've been walking home like with my friends i, I hung out with as many punjabi people as i could growing up because i love punjabi people but um but uh like we would be walking home and a lot of times i would get um like we would all like as a group or they would single us out a lot of times like we would get like older people like oh like your religion is invalid. Like you need to become Christian or get out of my country or you need oh. to go back to your country. And then meanwhile, like I grew up in a pretty strict Catholic house. Like my mother is not Indian. Like she's from the island of Jamaica. And on Jamaica, they practice pretty strict Catholic, like cat like cat um not necessarily even Catholic, but like Christianity. You know but they don't see that. They see you're brown, so you can't be Christian exactly you see you're brown so it's either you have to be the same religion as me or you have to get out of here not knowing that we're probably in similar religions yeah but i don't even i don't even consider myself like like one religion i don't i don't i, I see too many flaws with religion to consider i believe in god but like a single secular god but i don't i i find too many flaws with specified religions yeah but, um so is that around the age of like like when 9-11 happened, because obviously we, so, when we were speaking, that was it, that you were saying that was a big thing as well, like a turning point. Yeah, so that was another thing. I remember 9-11 happened when I was in the second or first grade. So and what's that, like four, four-ish, four years old-ish? Yeah, around that, yeah, around that. I was three, yeah, four, four or five. Um, so yeah, I can distinctly remember after 9-11 i remember i was in the same school like for first second and third that was the the longest time i was in elementary school for first second and third and i remember going into school the second year for second grade the racist jokes went crazy they were crazy and and then you like think like second graders really shouldn't really know how to say like Oh, you fucking terrorist! Like you need to, like you, like, you know, just the the basic nine eleven jokes, whatever. And then I remember the first time I got into a fight was actually the year after nine eleven. Uh, I I don't think it was like it wasn't anything like like racist out like outright racism, 
but I feel like there was a lot of tension afterwards because it was it was just a, like some random kid just came and attacked me. Like, like okay. we were outside playing ball. Like, I feel I don't know. Like, it wasn't blatant, blatantly anything. He didn't even tell me anything. Like, but he just came out and attacked me. Like, but me being the person I am, I beat him up, of course. But but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I could I definitely know that. I've experienced it many times, like the 9-11 jokes, the racist jokes, the the turban jokes, the all of this. And in in New York, I feel like ignorance is high, so they, this is natural out here. Yeah, right. I can imagine. Obviously, with it being like the place that it actually happened, like yeah, it's yeah. probably going to be the worst. I remember hearing stories, um, like growing up and stuff. Of I think there was a there was like a Indian guy, Punjabi guy who had a turban and he was getting on the subway to go to, I think, university or whatever, like over there. And mm-hmm. I think he got killed because people thought he was running into the the subway with like his mm-hmm. backpack full of books, but they thought it was like a bomb or something. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember hearing that. I'm not sure like um, how like truthful that was at the time because I just remember being a kid and it was like, mm-hmm. like it was obviously, we got it here as well, but I don't think it was nearly as bad. Yeah, most definitely. I, I think that I wouldn't find that hard to believe. One of my cousins, actually, from my Punjabi side, he, um, he like, uh, I don't know the correct term for it. So, excuse me, I'm not really as educated as, like, uh, someone who practices the religion, like, every day. But he he would go to Gurdwara and he would, like, sing and play the instruments, the harmonium and the tabla, yeah. or whatever. And then one day he was outside. Like he was walking, he was in front of a hospital and somebody came and they shot him in the head. No way. He survived, but thank God. But what? You know, like New York is very is very like ignorant. Like I think now during this corona thing, our homicides, our gun shooting has gone up a hundred percent in just the boroughs. The um so I, I'm not too sure of this, so you'll probably have to correct me, because uh, uh, obviously in the UK you can only he- hear so much about uh, America but yeah. after the um, Black Lives Matter movement isn't New York one of the places that got rid of the police with the like defund the police sort of thing so the thing with New York I, I'm pretty sure we passed a cut like a budget cut of like something like a I don't know if it was a billion I don't know if it was like a hundred million something like that but we cut the we cut a lot of funds from the police that we that, that came from like taxes and stuff but um i don't necessarily agree with that i don't necessarily agree with that because these are the people that are protecting us at the end of the day like they're the wrong people to get mad like that I yeah 100 percent. do you think that it's got worse since that's happened uh as in like yeah, overall most, definitely, most definitely uh yeah most definitely I still can't believe your cousin got shot in the head. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Obviously, he in the UK, he, he, wore, he wore the pajama. Like, you know, like he, he doesn't, he looks like the least threatening person ever. Yeah. Yeah. You know? But that's just really, that's just New York. People out here get shot over parking spots. You get shot because you're not taking, you're not giving up your parking spots to the next guy. Wow. You can't, I can't like, like imagine that being like a reality over here. I think obviously we, we don't have guns here. So yeah, like da- down south in London and stuff, me being from Newcastle, um, like down south in London, there is there is a lot of knife crime, mm-hmm. but obviously it's still not guns. Like that's the level. It's just... Yeah, it's very sad. It's very, very sad because people, especially in New York, people lose their life for literally so let, like, like nothing. Like I don't know if you, if you remember, but there was that 15-year-old kid that that got killed outside the deli in the Bronx. His name was Junior, something like that. They have little children, that children, children shooting children out here. Like there's little kids shooting little kids, little kids shooting adults, there's adults shooting little kids. Like Almost it's really, a, it's really like, it's crazy. It's really Especially crazy. for you, like as now like a father as well, that must be like sort of scary yeah, to raise your daughter definitely. in an environment like this. Definitely, like originally, like where, my daughter's mother is from is is not a good place at all. Like you, you'll find someone gets shot every week, like every week someone gets shot. It's like I clearly I don't want my daughter living in that type of situation. Like just yeah. the fact that there's guns going off, you have to worry about a freaking like 
some gun just falling through the, I mean, some bullet just falling through the roof and hitting you. They have strays. Like, people get hit by strays. Like, it's crazy. Some things you got to watch out for over in that neighborhood, too, is people pretend to be Verizon <laughs> employees, and they come knocking on your door. And if you don't answer, your your, your house isn't marked. They're going to they're gonna come and rob your house. Like, that's some oh, later, okay. later date and time. Verizon being, um, like, a, a phone company, isn't it? Yeah, phone company. Oh, okay. but it's it's just crazy. New York is grimy. New York is grimy. That it's it's hard to wrap your head around when, like, obviously in, you you so far removed from that sort of situation. Um, yeah. go, going back to so you got in, you said you got into your first fight a year after nine eleven, so you were probably around five. Yeah. And then you ended up getting into martial arts around six. Do you think that was like a a direct correlation? Not for me. Not for me, but I feel like maybe for my mother, especially the time being what it was back in the day, she probably herself has gotten a lot of 9-11 comments herself. Meanwhile, she's from the island of Jamaica, and she's half Guyanese, which is another island over there. But um, the main reason I really got into it, I can remember, was because, like, as a child, I always used to watch Bruce Lee DVDs. Like, growing up in Queens, we weren't really... We didn't really have money like that until we moved to Long Island, right? So before that in Queens, we didn't have that much money. Like everything I everything I watched was on VCR. Like it was all recorded tapes or whatever. So my uncles, they would send me um, like Bruce Lee movies. And that's literally all I would have on repeat all day. I said, fuck the Disney. I'm going to watch Bruce Lee. I didn't want to watch you know, Ant Life, none of that. I want to watch Bruce Lee kicking people in the face. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then I got a poster in my room. Meanwhile, I'm a little kid. <laughs> like yeah, my mom yeah. was like, oh, it just, he just has to go. He has to go. This is, this is calling. <laughs> that is nuts. Uh, we were quite similar. Like, my dad used to watch so many, like, kung fu movies. Um, so you got into MMA around six. And then when did you, like, how fast did you catch the bug? Did you realize it was what you wanted to do, like, long term? When did you start, like, taking it seriously? All right, cool. One second. Let me just peek at my daughter. She hasn't made a sound. I think she yeah, knows. But um, so yeah, the bug. I would say, um, for now, do you mean the bug for like competition, as in like full contact sports, or do you mean like just competing, like period? When do you catch the bug for like martial arts first? Because I d like were, were you competing before you were even passionate about martial arts, and then you got the bug of like, oh, I actually like winning. Or was it you started going to like um, an MMA gym and then or like a, a karate gym and started thinking, oh, I actually like this and then started to take it further? All right. So so. So when I started karate, uh, I started at one school and I was in that school for till I was 14. So I, I did a lot of time in that school and um, my competition started in that school a year into me uh joining so when i was like six like seven or six maybe around there seven but um i feel like the bug for winning it didn't really come to me until i started doing full contact sports like um so i started doing boxing kickboxing that kind of winning i mean that kind of competition because i feel like the the rule set that i fought with in karate we didn't have any punches to the face. Like we would stop right here. And then like you'd have to punch, stop and bring it back. And that would count as a point. But I felt like, um, like that wasn't enough. Like I was like really unfulfilling. I felt like there was always some kids that were always faster than me in the competition, but they weren't stronger than me because how I fought was I always, I always like how I trained, I always trained with adults. Like, so I would get hit by like adults as a kid. And yeah. those hits wouldn't, wouldn't, like those hits would hurt, but like going from that to getting hit by like a child, like a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 11-year-old child is a huge difference. So I felt like that was always unfulfilling. Like I would, I, the only times I would lose is when someone was faster than me because karate fighting is more like playing tag. It's like mm -hmm. somebody punches you in the stomach, that's like tag, that's, oh, that's one point. If somebody yeah, kicked yeah. you in the head, that's tagged, that's three points. So it was more like speed-based. 
So, I mean, I did good. I did pretty well. I would go to dinners, like get my awards, but it wasn't, not that it was meaningless, but it wasn't really fulfilling. Like I, I felt like I could do more. But then I broke my nose in karate in front of my mom. My mom was, I was like 13. My mom was watching me spar. And I don't know if you know what an ax kick is, but I got ax kicked right on the nose. And then my nose shattered from that. Like oh. it broke in like three, four different places going up the nose like that. But um, after that, my mom wanted me to do, she actually put me in um, JKD, which is Bruce Lee's martial art. Which yeah, is yeah, I've heard of that. What does that for Jeet Kune Do? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Jeet Kune Do, which okay. is a branch off of Wing Chun. It's like a MMA version of Kung Fu. But, um, but yeah, once I started doing that, I started um, doing more contact, more more practical movements, because karate is like, boom, boom, like a lot of rigid rigidness, like, uh, it's, like if somebody comes and punches you like this 20 times, like you're not gonna, yeah, yeah. All of them. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, but once JKD I JKD is more like free flowing. Exactly. JKD is more hands, it's more boxing hands, jab, cross hooks, those kind of things. And then I started getting the itch to fight a little bit when I was doing that because my, my coach was telling me about fighting. But we didn't, there isn't really like a, a competition platform for Jeet Kune Do. So then um, after that, I, I found the UFC gym. I was probably 14, 15. Mm -hmm. And then I had been training JKD for about like three years. And then I supplemented my JKD training with Kali and C-Lot, which are both uh, Filipino martial arts. Right, okay. Kali is weapons fighting, a lot of weapons fighting. It's also hand fighting, but it's a lot of weapons fighting with like sticks and knives, like a curved knife. And then C-Lod is more so for like fighting multiple people at one time. So like three, oh. or two people, five people, whatever have you. And then, so, so, um, yeah. So I, then I found UFC gym. I got with my, with my trainer, Crew Kru, Rodney. I owe everything to Crew Rodney. He's the one who started me on, on Muay Thai. We had four fights. They were unofficial. Um, Oh yeah, it's a funny story. My first fight, I actually, uh, I went to um, this gym in Brooklyn. I was like 15, 16. And uh, the corner, like it's my corner and then it's their corner, right? Like that's how you start in the fight. Yeah, and yeah, you yeah. Come out the corner and, and in your corner are your coaches. Mm -hmm. And I remember the whole fight, the other dudes, corner men, they were yelling, oh, kill that Hindu, kill that Hindu. No way. Like, bro, I'm not even, what? <laughs> it's, it's still occurring, even in a fight. But yeah, surely like, that, fight. that like, uh, defeats the purpose of having, like, so. Yeah, of doing anything kid-related, like, sport. Like, that. that exactly. You would think that martial arts, because all you, like, what, obviously you do see the sort of, like, um, the flamboyantness and the sort of digs at each other in, like, press conferences. But everybody knows that afterwards you shake each other's hands. Exactly. And it's, a, it's a respectful sport. But yeah. that is like, that's one of them lines that you shouldn't really cross. Yeah, at all. And then it was okay because I beat him up. But um, <laughs> yeah, I beat him up bad. I remember, but it was really like, it was really like another, like it threw my head for another loop because like the, his whole team and his whole, like he himself, none of them were from America. They were all like Russian, but like they were like the type where it's like they're they're like I guess they're closer to like the South or Dagestan or whatever. So they have pigment in their skin. They have yeah, black yeah. hair. So it's almost. Do you it was, think they were doing it uh, as in like maliciously and actually like like to be racist, or do you think they were doing it to get in your head? I think that it was both of the same because mm -hmm. I to get into your head, yeah, I can I can tell you racist stuff. Like I know that'll get into your head, but I could also say something like excuse me but oh get that chubby motherfucker like you know like yeah yeah you know? it have to be that i feel like that was just a little too much like you cross yeah. the line yeah you could be like oh get that skinny toothpick motherfucker but oh get that hindu motherfucker like you know yeah. that don't get me wrong i'm not trying to excuse it i'm just trying to like understand uh -huh. why they would possibly do it oh of course and either that's, way it's too far that's the thing with fighting it's a lot of people they take it too seriously but they take it like 
like more than what it really is. And when you're making it a sport, it, it's a sport. It's not, yeah, like, sure, people fight each other that are angry at each other, but like a lot of the times people bring animosity into fighting that doesn't need to be there. Like sell tickets is one thing, but but like mocking and doing all the other stuff, that's unnecessary. I mean, it comes, I've been mocked plenty of times. I've been called every name in the book, but like that, it, it just wasn't necessary there. But I ended up beating him up so bad. And then his we, we fought in his gym. So his judge, it was his judges and they all gave him the decision. But the crowd, the crowd that was watching the fight, all of them were chanting Harveer Singh one and then two. Like they had to carry him out the ring. I was I was walking out the ring. They had to oh, carry wow. that dude out the ring. And they still gave him the decision. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. You, do, you do hear about like obviously corruption and stuff, but that's like surely you, you're taking uh-huh. out the judges' hands by that point. New York is one of the most corrupt places too, and <laughs> just with anything you do in fighting, especially because like uh, the judges, they don't really care. They just, I mean, it was in his gym too, but in a lot of New York fighting, when it comes to boxing, kickboxing, like stuff that requires judges to do points a lot of the times they'll just go for whoever like sells the most tickets because that's who made the most money or they'll go for whoever they like the best you know yeah yeah um what about like uh like the steroid side of things because i've heard that um new york's quite bad for that sort of thing like i follow boxing like religiously sort of thing and um a couple years back was Meant to be Big Baby Miller. I don't know if you. Ah, uh, I know him. Oh, do you I know him? Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna say too much then. I'll not say too no, much. No, you good? No, you good? I'm pointing at him. If he's watching this, maybe oh, okay. <laughs> he's probably watching it. But yeah, I know him. I trained with him a little before his Coca fight. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He used okay. to train and with my with my team because back in the day, my team was crazy, and I always trained with the crazy adults. Like I always trained with adults. I was that little kid. I was in there. So a lot of people came to train with us. Like Uriah Hall came there. Big Baby came there. I don't know if you follow like kickboxing, but um, what's his name? Uh, he's in glory. Oh, Wayne Barrett trained out of there. Um, Asa Tenpal came there. Mad people used to come there to get training with us because we were just sharks. We were sharks. That's nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, so he, he got caught for... A lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, is that is that common in in combat sports? Then, like, in America, because over oh, here we God. have like UCAD, uh, which that? is a UK UK anti doping, um, mm. and they're like they're really strict. But mm. then when so I follow like um, boxing a lot, as I said, and there's a promoter here called Eddie Hearn. Mm-hmm. Um, he he has. Have you heard of like, Anthony Joshua? The yeah. Heavyweight trap, yeah. He's his promoter basically. Okay, okay. Like he's venturing into the states a lot. Um, he's actually got a show on tonight or tomorrow night. Devin Haney. I don't know if you know who he is. I know Devin Haney. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, but he's like back and forward between the states and here, and he's like he always says that it's a lot worse for doping in the states than it is like over here. So I don't know like how common it is. And then obviously Miller happens, and he's got like four or five different substances mm-hmm. in him. Um, and he gets I don't even know about that I don't even know about that but um I feel like as far as the 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 doping man I think it would be it would be rare to find the person who's a coach like myself or a trainer Mm -hmm. like myself that hasn't seen somebody shoot up or take some type of pills like as far as like uh, steroids kind of shooting up like in their butt or taking some pills in in the locker room or someone trying to like convince someone else or I, like men and women too I, I know women personally who take steroids I know men personally who take steroids I know fighters who take steroids like I don't take steroids no put that out there. <laughs> I, don't take steroids. I just I just eat swell I fast a lot a lot of people ask me how I get like the type of physique that I get I fast a lot which is very important especially for building muscle but yeah steroids like the, there's a lot of fighters that do steroids but the thing is for amateur fighting i don't know how it is in the uk mm-hmm. but for amateur fighting they don't test you for any drugs so at, you all. Can take, at all you could take every drug ever 
and you will not get still be able to fight when it comes down to fight night. You yeah. could take the drugs before you, before like two days before you fight. You could take the drugs on you when you're going to weigh-ins. You could take the drugs after the fight. They don't do no pre-fight, no post-fight, nothing. So you may very well, most more likely than not, especially if you climb in the ranks, you're gonna fight someone who has is on steroids, and it's something I've done. Like not necessarily in the ring, but I've been to so many gyms. Like I've seen, I've seen people on steroids. Like I know you can like, it's steroids are so common. There's a there's a way to discern who is on steroids and who is not, and not simply off of oh he has muscle. It's more so oh you I punched him in the face, and usually that punch rocks the shit out of someone. But he turned his head and he looked at me like the Terminator, and he bit down and he went forward. And his muscles, the muscles, like they get cut. They get cut up, they're swollen, cut. Like you, you could see the look in their eyes. It's like the terminator. Nothing is putting them down unless it's like some some real heavy shot. And it's That's literally crazy. So does it's that so not crazy. like does that not um is that not like a cause for concern for yourself? Because if you're not taking steroids and you are going into the ring with someone who is and you're mm-hmm. hitting them with your best shots for like how how uh, how long a Muay Thai fight? Is it, is it like twelve rounds as well, or is it? No, no. So depending on the rule set, it it's um three rounds. It could go up to five. It could be four, but um usually it's two minutes for amateurs and three minutes for pros per round. So like, you you're just imagine you're in a fight and you're just absolutely obliterating this guy for four rounds, and then in the fifth round. Any normal person would have been on the floor, on the canvas, fight over. But in the fifth round, you're tiring out because he's juiced up to his eyeballs and then he mm-hmm. comes back and hits you with like a fatal shot or something. That mm-hmm. just ends the fight. Is that not like a scary situation for you to be in or like a cause for concern? Absolutely. It is definitely a scary situation. But I mean, that's part of the fight game. You got to know how to duck and dodge, weave, block move the feet you got to be ready for everything but um it never will it never will deter me or like shake me enough for me to start doing that I feel like absolutely the most farthest thing I would ever do in my life and this is me being completely honest is if I'm older and I'm still competing then I would probably take testosterone to to heal myself and it probably wouldn't be crazy but you know like fighting really takes a toll on the body but steroids is something that will help help shorten your your fight career a lot. And um, oh, does it? Well, I'm sorry. H- how so? How so? It'll start to break your body down. Like if you think about it, like let's say my max without stor- steroids, I'm I'm lifting like this is like a hundred. Let's say right now with steroids, I'm lifting two hundred. That's yeah. like this. That's gonna put wear and tear on my body. Like, especially if I'm not, especially if I'm just a juice head and I just shoot up and then go lift weights. I don't know proper form. I don't know technique. I don't know anything. My joints are going to deteriorate in no time. They're not meant to to go over. They're not overloaded. Like, you know, that, and especially for fighting, man, that's the thing with, with, with roid, with, uh, you ever heard the term roid rage? Yeah, yeah. That's a thing. That's a thing. And there's people that will roid rage and... They'll beat someone up, but there's people that will go into rage and they'll get beat up. But that's fighting. It's 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 not it's not for certain. Like, yeah, you could be on you could be on steroids, but if I can kick you in the mouth with my shin, you're gonna go down. Have yeah. you ever been either in the ring like with a professional fight or just sparring and identify like can you tell if somebody's um on like void rage? Not just yeah. on voids, but like fully in void rage. Yeah, without a doubt. It's like it's like I told you before, like just like just now if you hit someone and like let's say you just keep teeing off on them and they're eating their shots with their face. Like it's not like they're cowering or like they're oof or like you know, it's like you see it. They look like a bull. It's like a bull. It's um it's a scary thing, but I fought a lot of scary people, so it take a lot to scare me. Yeah, so you're not deterred from it. No, no. Like I wish I could just pull up some pictures right now and show you, but I've always been like the little skinny brown dude that's like this <laughs> in the picture with a room full of like, excuse my bluntness, but like 
big black dudes that are all like this, like cut, all fighting at like 180. I walk around at one, well, what, back when I was like a teenager, I was walking around at like 135 fighting with these dudes that are 180. Right now I walk around 150, so I'm a little better. But, 135, that's in pounds, isn't it? So, I'm sorry? Yeah, that's pounds. So what is that? What's that, nine stone? 67, something like that, 67 kilo. 67 kilo or like okay. nine and a half stone uh, we like i work in stones over here but some people work in kg some people work in pounds uh-huh. yeah yeah i see i see so you're quite a small guy then so what h- how tall are you i'm about six foot how are you still light if you're six foot i'm uh it really is like you see me i got muscle yeah but you're just yeah, really muscle. skinny yeah but um it's usually i honestly don't know I don't know for certain, <laughs> but I could tell you some some health facts that like. Are I, you sure have. you're not taking the steroids? Yeah. No, I'd <laughs> probably like be over. Some or something. <laughs> no, I feel like I'd be so much over. Like if I took steroids, I feel like I would be jacked. <laughs> no, but this the steroids like to help you cut and stuff as well. So like a lot of boxers get no. caught, like the the um like smaller fighters like Canelo for example, he got mm. caught for um Clem oh. Wow. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I didn't even know that. You know, I don't pay attention to steroids too much because I, I leave those shits alone. I swear, I swear to you, I leave yeah. them alone. But um, but I think that my lifestyle is really um, really contributes to it. Like ever since, like I was in high school, like I used to be, I used to have chubby cheeks and a little belly. And then mm-hmm. when I was in high school, like I remember I sat down, like, and I was like, you know what, I gotta um. I got to get a six pack because everybody with six packs are cool. And then literally every day after school, every day on the weekends, on, on spring break, summer break, every day, I used to come up with workout plans in my, write them down in my notes, do the workout plans on how to get my six pack, got my six pack within like a year. Then ever since then, I just feel like, like my body just, it, it, it does well at maintaining itself. Like if I'm not, if I'm not working out, for some reason, my body just doesn't get hungry. Like it doesn't, it, it, I don't know, it's efficient, I guess. Like I don't, I don't eat unless I'm hungry or I don't eat unless I'm expending like, energy. Like yeah, if yeah. I don't eat, like if I didn't, like I worked out today and the only thing I ate today was probably like two cups of rice, like a cup of, a cup of chicken. Like I still got it on the, on the couch, uh, like five, like, string beans um you know like i i do good at not overeating and you, and you like mentioned I, a few I, times I, fasting people, as well i'm sorry you've mentioned a few times that fasting as well so like how yeah, long yeah. do you fast for the longest i fasted for was 72 hours which is three days but um without without any food at all but with just straight water like what was that for like were you trying to cut weight for a fight or no, I feel like I I fast personally because it's like now I'm not like religious like I practice one religion but I feel like it does help to get you closer to God through fasting and I feel like fasting has so many health benefits like you can increase your muscle mass if you fast like after 48 hours of fasting your your growth hormone and testosterone uh increases by five times. Oh so, really? Yeah, so if you if you do if you see that's the thing, it's a science though. I'm not just like ah fucking I'm not gonna eat. Like like I do it, like I'll eat certain things before I fast, I eat certain things after I fast, certain shakes, like I I take a lot of sea moss. I don't know if you know what sea moss is. No, no. It's uh it has a whole bunch of nutrients and shit. It doesn't taste like anything, but I put it in like a shake. But so this way I make sure that my body has all of the essentials that I need. And anything else, like, like I don't, like I don't need to be eating three meals a day. Like I, I probably haven't had a three meal a day day for the last like three years, probably. Yeah. You would think it's like the opposite. Like if you're fasting for that long, that your body stops producing uh, um, testosterone and and things like that. But it's interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like the reverse effect sort of thing. If you if you think about it like this, it's like. Well, one, it's a fact that we use about 75% of the food, of the energy from the food that we eat 
to break down all the food that we're eating in the day. So 75% of the energy that you take from 100 is being used to digest all the food that you keep constantly putting in your body, right? So if you have less, if you have more energy, you can use it more in your body to recover, to you, I actually have gotten like some injuries where I feel like they would put people out, like they wouldn't want to fight anymore, but I've recovered myself off of diet and exercise, certain exercise. But, but yeah, some, damn. That's very like, interesting, 75%. Oh yeah, yeah, use. for fasting. And it's, um, That's it's funny. like, if you, if you, if you don't, if you have that extra 75%, you could do so much more. There's people that run full marathons that fast for 21 days before their marathon mm -hmm. like that's insane to me that you could fast for 21 days if you're gonna run a marathon but it, it just attests to it that's um it's uh the, the human body is literally a temple and how you treat it is what you're gonna get out of it you know 100 yeah. percent. yeah so you when we were talking beforehand you were mentioned that you uh practice like a lot of different methods of mma so <laughs> Is it okay? I'm familiar with some of them, but we've touched briefly on some of them uh, in the conversation so far. Was it okay if we just like, if you could explain the differences or what is um, like the specifics of different versions of MMA? So we'll, we'll start with um, Shotokan. Did I pronounce Shotokan. that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's karate, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm just going to, first thing I'm going to say is uh, MMA is uh yeah it's a term for mixed martial arts which is like a, th this is where the term gets tricky because mma is a style you train in M mma like that as your style you're an mma fighter you're a boxer you're a kickboxer right. you know? but um uh what i do like i don't i don't have any mma fights as of yet I have kickboxing fights. I've trained so many different martial arts, but MMA is just used to describe like MMA, which is like UFC. That's MMA. Bellator. Yeah. That's MMA. All right. So, so Shotokan, Shotokan. That um, what that was is well, I did it for a lot of years, and um, it's a lot of self defense. What it was first started for was self defense and uh in feudal Japan when they were, when they were getting like, um, I don't know if they were like ruled by the Chinese or the Chinese just felt like, like in, imperializing. Or I don't know what the Chinese were doing, but they basically, they had, they had problems with the Chinese and they took the Chinese style Kung Fu made, made Shotokan. So Shotokan is a lot of Kung Fu like movements. A lot of it is, is not practical. A lot of it was made for like, someone that has a sword, not often am I gonna fight someone with a sword. You know, yeah. a lot of it is impractical in that you have to fold up before you execute a block, whereas boxing is just, yeah. you know, slaps. But I would say the mentality behind Shotokan is what is most key. It teaches you how to, how to be strong-minded and how to have like an iron body. And that comes from Kung Fu, the iron body training. Like you take, you can take hits on the arms, the legs, the shoulders, whatever. So a lot of my success, I would attribute to Shotokan because it, it set me up by giving me a proper mentality to go about like in, in my combat sports career so far, right? And also in life, like, it, like the part of the reason I can fast for three days straight is because when I was like, eight years old, I had like grown men like punching me in the stomach till I threw up. Like fasting hunger pains is nothing compared to being punched in the stomach till you throw up like that. that yeah. That's what really hurts. But but yeah, I feel like that's the real, that's the real takeaway from Shotokan. People, some people like to say Shotokan is not, is not a good, is not a, like a proper martial art to train, but you have, everything is what you take it for. Like Bruce Lee told you, to, said, take what works for you and discard what doesn't and every style has certain things like that so yeah shotokan is more so like a like a mental training kind of thing it's, it's a good it's for anyone that 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 watches this that's interested in like fighting i would i would recommend shotokan as a good supplement 
but there's a lot of mick dojos or like fake schools that teach like uh short versions or like short-handed ways to do karate and help you get your black belt in the slowest in the fastest amount of time possible right. when it actually should take you at at minimum eight years to get your black belt i think that's what it, what it is in, J- in japan right yeah. but then they just fast track it in some of the dodgy gyms exactly it's all for the money right um and then so so basically that's like for mental fortitude and like gaining like a solid body so you you used to get hit mm-hmm. okay that seems like it would be quite um helpful in every type of martial art though mm-hmm. even in life and like pretty much well, a lot yeah. of aspects in life yeah definitely mm-hmm. Um, what about uh, judo? Because like I hear about judo a lot. It's in the Olympics and all that stuff. But I don't actually know like the what makes judo different from anything else. Basically. Mm. So the reason I took judo was for a specific reason was because in my karate school, which which also taught judo, was if you wanted to learn the the cool stuff or like the most deadly stuff or the stuff that you're going to flip someone and they're going to fall on their head stuff. You have to know how to fall. And judo like, teaches you how to fall properly without hurting yourself. Like, especially if you're on concrete, it teaches you safe ways to fall, how to break your fall and what have you. So that's why I started taking judo. I wanted to compete in judo, but because a lot of what judo is, is um, so in competition is literally who can throw who or who could get the other person on the ground or on their knees first but uh so i like that aspect of it but it's um it's very interesting to learn um i'm like a super martial arts nerd right so (laughs) so i'm just a super nerd i'm just gonna say that before i tell you this but um so in certain styles there's called is jitsu right like you have jujitsu yeah and jutsu, ninjutsu, right? And in certain styles, you have do, karate do, judo, uh, so then whatever the rest of the dos are, they have so many, right? So the difference between the jitsus and the dos are jitsus are a way of attack. So jujitsu is how can I attack this person in a way that is going to make them tap out or whatever, right? That's it. It's attack, 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 attack. Yeah. And then do right? being defense. Yeah, dude, do. Not necessarily defense, what do means, because the literal translation of jitsu is attack. The literal translation of do is a way of life, right? So, oh, okay. but that, like, so, so why, why I, I, I enjoy do martial arts is because, have you ever heard of, like, like the word zen, or like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Or like, people can, like, let's say, like archers have a Zen, like they get into a certain headspace where you can have creative ideas, you can learn things, learn lessons from, you can learn a lot from somebody that's half your size, literally in height and weight, can just walk up to you and throw you over their shoulder and you tumble two times and fall down on the ground. You can learn a lot from things like that. And Mm -hmm. like, not only in that, like, yeah, this little person can beat my ass, but in body mechanics like oh like like the the shoulder has to be at a certain angle the hip has to be up in a certain way like you know like dull martial arts i feel like teaches me a lot about life and not like so much in like like if i've learned how to fall then i would be good in life but like they have like little secret lessons in there i feel like that help you to grow because that's what do martial arts are like how i was saying karate do shotokan is karate do that sort of teaches you to be mentally strong or have like a solid body like it teaches you more so than teaches you life skills or skills to help better your like yourself and skills to help better your body and jitsu skills help better your body like yeah yeah yeah, i get you judo Judo, I enjoyed that a lot because it teaches you how to be gentle. It teaches you how to be gentle while remaining at the same time being able to throw someone on their freaking neck. You yeah, know, yeah. you have to be gentle to do that. And that, just that concept doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's you, why you would think you like have that. to be aggressive to do that. Exactly, exactly. But the best judo, the best judo, like black belts and red belts, all like the old little short Japanese dudes. I'm not trying to be racist that 
like have been doing this for like 70 years. Like if you ever see them spar with their with their six foot, like 250, 300 pound judo black belts, like you would think like it looks like almost as if they could hold a flower in between the teeth the whole time and still do it without damaging the flower. You yeah. know, and that's just Not amazing. Control. Exactly. That's just amazing that someone like that could just have their way with someone whoo, 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 and yeah. keep a rose still like that in their mouth, you know? So do you think, going back to, you, you mentioned how um, you're not big as in like frame-wise, like stature-wise, do you think yeah. that's helped you in learning things this intricate because then you're not um, overpowering people? So if you you need to learn a technique in like judo, like a, a, as, as like a hip toss judo? Yeah, that, that, that's something that's in judo. Yeah, like sweeps and hip tosses and things like that. Like, so instead of you being this really built guy and you can just do it just from sheer muscle power, mm. do you think that your size has helped you um, learn techniques better because you can't rely on sheer power? So that's, a, that's like a double-edged sword. So it's like, I can be slim and I can be strong, like sort of like, I would say my stature is closer to like what Bruce Lee's is, where he's small, but he's muscularly solid. Mm. Like, yeah, you can be fast. You can, you can have strength only so far, but when it comes to like grappling, I'm gonna get, I'd be more likely to get my arm broke because my arm is so long. Like my reach is like the equivalence of like six foot five. What is that? Like 77 inches. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, so my arm is a liability when I'm doing grappling. My legs are liabilities, you know? Like long when limbs. I'm kickboxing, I will beat someone up, you know, but judo jiu-jitsu yeah i'll beat someone up but you know i'm i'm at a disadvantage whereas certain things i'm advantage mm -hmm. as in like i have long reach i can generate a lot of power because my fist has to travel farther but if i was bigger like i could have advantages like more muscle i have more mass to hit you with my arm just weighs more so my head is just gonna hit you with more force because there's more mass on it. yeah you know? yeah but i feel like with with your body type, that's how you have to structure yourself. So the way that I like to like to fight or spar is I'm more of a technical fighter. And I like to work angles. I like to pick my shots. Like sometimes I'll be very hype, 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 throw a lot, throw a lot, throw a lot. Then sometimes I'll sit back, pick my shots, throw one, blah, 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 move, throw a couple, move, you know, because it's the type of person I am is, um. I'm not big, so I can't really take shots like that. Like, like yeah, I could take a leg kick, but it's gonna hurt. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen like uh, I've seen on your Instagram as well. You had um one of your knockouts where mm -hmm. you were you did a bit of I think it was a kickboxing fight or mm -hmm. a Muay Thai fight because you you did a few shots with um like a few punches and then you just like sort of stood back, pivoted, and then hit him with like a head kick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that was lethal, man. That was that was. Sick. Thank you, thank you. But that that would be a that would be a good example because. The dude I was fighting was huge. That dude was huge. He had a whole lot of muscle. He he walks around at 180 pounds. I walk around at 155 pounds. Like that dude was huge compared to did me. Did he did he have to come down to your yeah. weight and then yeah. what like rehydrate and then he like gets back to exactly. oh, okay. okay. Yeah, so basically the day before we meet at a certain weight, we meet there and then we fight the next day. So that gives him time to hydrate. Yeah, but both yeah, of us time to hydrate, eat food, and yada yada. What, yeah, um, one, what weight class like do you normally meet at? So like, when I first, all right. So when I first started, like before I started getting my official fights, I was fighting at one thirty five. I would cut down from one thirty eight because I walk around one thirty eight. I would fight on one thirty five. Um, then after I went, uh, like to my when I stopped doing my underground fights, like uh excuse me um I did I fought at like 145 which is and I used to walk around most like 149 mm -hmm. I'm sorry and then um now I walk around at like 155 when I'm when I'm training when I'm not training I walk around 160 like 165 but when I'm training I walk around 155 and I fight I probably fight like my next fight probably would be at 150 maybe 155. I don't like to cut weight a lot. Yeah. I like to be, I like to be as close to normal as possible. 
Fair enough. It's probably the healthiest way to be honest as well in the long absolutely. term. Absolutely, absolutely. Way better on the kidneys. There's people out here that will cut so much weight in one day, just water weight, and their kidneys just get destroyed. They get crazy kidney pain the day day before their fight. Like I can't do that to myself. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of people that do a lot. Like you know what Chris Cyborg is? Cyborg. Um, the MMA fighter. She looks like oh, a man. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. She sh- yeah. shaved her head as well. Oh, I don't know if she shaved her head. She probably did. I don't know. Right. I haven't. I'm not up to date with her, but yeah, she cuts like 40 pounds in like two days of straight water weight. Like that's, that's gonna lot. take a toll. Yeah, that'll take a toll on her body soon. So how how do you do you like tra- have you seen her train or something or how do you know huh? how, how do you know how much she cuts in weight? Uh, she has like documentaries like oh like, okay, like, okay. They show her and she's just like in a bathtub in some hot bathtub and she's cutting so much weight she she can't like she can't go past this position and she's just there in a hot hundred hundred fifteen temperature uh, Fahrenheit bathtub and she's crying like oh let me out let me out i want to go i want to go and her wow her coaches are like no you gotta stay you gotta you know not only will that be detrimental to long-term health like surely that's gonna have a really big impact on her performance as well though she, yeah she got knocked out like her last, oh, her last cool. like that fight i remember she was fighting who was she fighting amanda nunez and she got her ass knocked out because that's the thing when you when you cut a lot of water weight you put your brain in uh in less less of its aqueous solution like you know how the brain has fluid in your head yeah. when you're dehydrated you have less of that so when you yeah, get yeah. hit the brain hits the side of the head with more force yeah. and that's why people that are dehydrated end up getting worse concussion and that that's why hydration is something that is very very serious like uh i don't know if you're familiar with one one fighting championship yeah yeah yeah, they actually have hydration tests. So if you yeah. don't pass your hydration test, you can't fight. Yeah, is, I've um I heard about that because there's another uh, Punjabi fighter in well, but I think he's Canadian, but he's from like Punjabi heritage, uh, heavyweight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're talking about Arjun. That's Saint the one. Lar, yeah, like yeah, that. that's the one. That's the one. I think he had a fight in the UFC, but I'm not sure if he like he won it or not. I, I I've seen him with one championship. Yeah, so he won. Sure I know he won one fight. I know he won one fight. I actually inboxed him too. I okay. he, he replied to my inbox. I I appreciated that. <laughs> oh, sick, sick. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure one championship's got a, a big presence in India now as well. Yeah, they're they're that's the money league. That's what if I could choose over UFC and one, I'll go to one. Oh really? Hell yeah. That's where all that's where you're getting all the money. I think UFC, you're lucky if you get forty thousand dollars to win your fight to win it you lose it i think you get ten thousand dollars to go up there in a professional fight and sometimes you get cut open sometimes you get break your leg all that for ten thousand dollars you would think that because the ufc is like a, a bigger promotion and more recognizable like globally you would think that they would pay more than one you would think, but UFC fighters don't even have medical benefits. They have some medical benefits. Actually, I think they just got some medical benefits. But it took very long to get medical benefits in a in a job that, you know, requires your body so, to be so physically demanding. And you have to literally, like, stand in front of someone who has the objective of, of hurting you and putting you in pain. Is it... Do you think it's, like, more if you're... Um, how do I phrase this? No, I, I don't want to say average, but if you're not a superstar, do you think it's beneficial to go to one? But if you are the the Conor McGregor, the Khabib, the John Jones, it's mm. probably more beneficial to be with UFC because they could demand so much more than, say, like the heavyweight champion of one championship. I see that. I see that. But I feel like even still, if you were a superstar in one, you would probably get more money compared to if you're a superstar in UFC. I don't know this. I don't know the statistics. This is just my thoughts. I don't know like if people that are superstars in UFC are making more, but I feel like you would make more in one due to the fact that the audience is a lot bigger. Um, and I think you could well, just like the whole the fight island thing in UFC, like how they have to go to another island to fight, I feel like that's slowly killing them. Like they're, they're losing a lot of money on certain things like that. So the UFC is just, 
and they don't pay their fighters as much as they should. They're always in heat about them not yeah. paying. And just, I don't know any job where you could call your boss and tell him you should pay me more and then he ends up paying you more. Like that just, that just shows you how much they're not getting paid. Like but they're rightfully should be getting paid a lot more, but they're not. And I feel like I would rather be a, a superstar in a place that has millions of viewers just over the TV mm -hmm. without um, having to sell pay-per-views than, than UFC where you have to be a super, super, superstar to get anything over like a million dollars. And that's if you're lucky. Well, why do you think that one gets more, um, more coverage than UFC? Because uh, sitting in the UK, I... I... I would think it's the opposite, but obviously no. I'm not into MMA as much as like um, boxing or something, so I'm, I'm not too aware. Yeah, no, that's cool, but it actually gets more because the audience is a lot bet bigger, and because uh, in on this side of of the uh, over here, like yeah, you guys watch us, mm -hmm. right, and we watch you, but your audience in 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 uh in considering all of Asia and Europe. And I don't know if one has fights in Africa. I don't know. But like mm -hmm. just Asia and Europe has a lot bigger audience than the fights that would happen over here that would have, let's say the majority is America and right, like yeah. Canada or stuff like that. Or like you'll have more people that's going to buy merch for mm -hmm. from one or buy tickets to go see one. You'll be able to sell more tickets, pack out more arenas, have more events, especially if you have a lot of fighters. Like their their income, I bet you if you put them next to each other, the income, it would probably be way, I don't know. It'll probably be somewhere around the same. I don't know. But one definitely pays their their fighters way better than fucking UFC. Honestly, UFC would at this point, UFC would be like uh all right, I'll take it. And you know, like when you apply to like a certain amount of schools when you're going to college and then like you only get into like certain ones you're like ah fuck i'll just take this one yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I that's ufc you. at this point <laughs> yeah i i should say that i i, I do agree with you for the ufc because um me and my friend have this conversation all the time saying mm -hmm. that um could, uh he, me and him talk about it in like boxing terms and he always says that boxing should be more like the ufc because mm -hmm. obviously like you have so many different um organizations in boxing that you, the matchups don't always happen mm, or whatever yeah. it is because of promoters or politics or mm. someone's with like a WBO and they don't want to fight a WBC or whatever it is. Um, but the argument that I have is that I don't think MMA, well, specifically the UFC, hasn't went through that transition of like um, around the Tyson era. So Tyson, everyone knows he got screwed by Don King, but it's mm -hmm. because Don King was basically the monopoly back then. He would mm -hmm. fight Tyson against other Don King promoted heavyweights, take most of the cut himself, and then give a tiny bit to uh, mm. the fighters, which when you bring it to modern day, it sounds very similar to Dana White. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So, like, if if you get rid of sort of that, make it a bit more open and um, competitive, and then you've got someone like Floyd who rips up his Golden Boy contract, becomes his own promoter, shows you the earning capabilities if you if you take control sort of thing, um, mm -hmm. I, d I don't think that transition happened in the UFC yet, but I feel like it is on the verge. And I think we've seen that with John Jones with the, if I move up to heavyweight, I need more money sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so See, I feel that, like that transition is going to happen. That's interesting. I feel like the transition will also happen, but I feel like maybe even the transition didn't even happen yet for one, two, but I feel like this is the thing with Americans majority of us i mean yeah we have athletes and stuff but but like our culture like like we, we like soccer isn't really big around here like we're not yeah. we don't have like big soccer like that's not our culture our, our culture is like football and baseball basketball whatever have you but but the culture in in asia i feel like revolves a lot more around martial arts so i feel like the supporting the fans that support would be will there'll be more fans that support over there just because their life and their culture and their traditions and stuff like you know we have gutka or we have yeah. like like kabaddi mm -hmm. you know like you know like our culture is similar to martial arts like it has some type of martial art the united states people we just eat mcdonald's 
Nothing. There's no you said it, not me. You said it, not me. You know, it's okay. And I'm in the United States right now, man. If you said it, I would agree with you. We don't have no culture. This is why our freaking, this is why everybody's outside shooting each other. All the girls are shaking butts. Yo, yo, no culture. No culture. Again, you said it, not me. I'm clearing my name, I'm clearing my name here. Yeah, I've not said anything bad against anyone from the United States. <laughs> oh, bro, I co sign. But, but I feel like the fans in one, they'll be more likely to give more of their money too because it, it's just more relatable. Like over here, like, yeah, we got boxing. Like that's relatable. But for the longest time, it was like I grew up around here. Like a, the longest time, people would be like, yo, what the fuck is UFC? Oh, they're kicking? They're kicking? What is yeah. that? I want to see two people stand in front of each other and just slug it out with their hands. Oh, they're on the ground? Oh, that's that's too weird for me. That's that's not how that's not how men should fight on the ground, you know. Like a lot of it, a, a lot of the reason why things blow up over here is because of like image or like, oh, that person's watching UFC. I want to watch them now. Or oh, that person is looking nice doing whatever this and that. Oh, I'm gonna do it now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like our boom might happen, but it probably won't happen in the same way as a boom would happen in Asia. Yeah, yeah, I get yeah. you. I get you. And one's probably more um, better positioned for that boom to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I understand. Um, so going through some of your more, uh, some more of the MMA practice. Um, I shouldn't say MMA practices because you say that's not the right terminology. But yeah. um, so yeah. boxing and kickboxing, you you you've learned both of them as well. Yeah. And I feel like that's quite easy to sort of. Explain boxing, obviously. Yeah, yeah, with your hands, and then kickboxing, just adding kicks. Yeah. Um, and then what is it? So the difference, as I understand it, between kickboxing and Muay Thai, is basically the addition of elbows and clinching. Okay. It see, this is where it gets sticky because there's there's three main rule sets in 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 stand up fighting, right? Like we call it like stand up fighting, just to encompass kickboxing, Muay Thai, and all the stand ups, right? So there's there's Muay Thai rules, which is like the actual name for it, Muay Thai rules, yeah. where you can do elbows, you have unlimited clinch, and you can do knees. Then there's glory rules, where it's um, it's a limited clinch, where it will either be like one second clinch, five second clinch, or you're only allowed to take one step in the clinch. Like you can clinch, take one step, throw something, but you can't, you have to let go. Is Glory no. um, a promotion? Yeah, Glory is also a promotion. Okay. Okay, it's okay. also a promotion. They have their own rule set called Glory Rules. Right. right? So, but so, from the sounds of it, that's basically just to make it more entertaining so that people aren't in the clinch yep. with you. Okay. Mix up the action, you see? And, um, and then K1 would be like super action where it's no, no elbows, no clinching at all. It's just punches and kicks. And you guys have to stand in front of each other and punch and kick each other all day. So that sounds just like normal kickboxing, basically. Yeah, basically. Okay. That's the three. That's the three. Like, there might be other rule sets, but as far as I've gone and all I've competed in, th- those are the three biggest rule sets. Right. Okay. Um, and then you've also um, done a, a bit of wrestling when you were younger as well, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the reason why you sort of didn't pursue that. Yeah, so I caught, um, I caught a skin disease. Uh, from wrestling which is big in wrestling it's not uncommon the whole team broke out with it it's called impetigo and i i had it on the back of my neck so what it is is when somebody doesn't clean the wrestling shoes and steps on the wrestling mat and then you have all these sweaty kids rolling around with bacteria and stuff and then they get sweat on each other like i think like 23 of us broke out with impetigo some people had it in their beards and they're all in their hair like you can't shave you can't cut your hair you know so after I got that, it was more so my mom was just like, "That's a dub. You can't, you can't do that." Was that you know, a, a young age? What what age? Yeah. Was it? That was in high school. I was probably in like tenth grade, eleventh grade. But yo, I love wrestling. Wrestling gave me a good foundation to help to help me with my jits. And though, some one thing I try to do is I try to learn, and like similar to what Bruce Lee said, I try to take what I what I know works for me and discard what I know doesn't work for me so like mm-hmm. stuff I've learned in, in wrestling has helped me to tap out 
people that have been doing jits for years and I've never really actually, I've maybe taken like 10 jujitsu classes, like real life jujitsu classes, but I can still like tap out certain people just based off of prior knowledge or just, just willpower really. Yeah. Um, and then I think you briefly mentioned it before, but um, what what so what's Silat and Sila, Sila and uh, what's the other one? Filipino Kali. Kali, yeah, Kali. Is, some people call it a screamer, but basically there's like there's like two hundred one hundred styles of each. There's like a hundred styles of Kali. There's like a hundred styles of like Sila. There's probably like five hundred in reality, but but the reason why is like it's like yoga like there's a lot of styles of yoga some of them are complete bullshit and it's like they're just for people who want money and they're trying to like draw you in give me money give me money yeah 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 type of thing but then there's some there's some yoga ones like that will really like put you through the work just like how there's some silat there's some kali that will really put you through the work like but it's also like karate there's like some mcdojos but silat is is like open hand and they complement each other so because they're from the same area they mm -hmm. they they have a lot of movements that flow into each other like styles mixing or you know like uh like while i'm doing c lot and i and i sweep someone like this let's say i also had my karambit knife on me which is something from kali just slice this that and the third then sweep them like you know like oh, they go yeah. hand in hand it's like like brother and sister right so Silat is like is more so focused on fighting multiple people at one time or like being able to like disarm or um what's the word um basically um, neutralize neutralize thank you neutralize one target while you're still in a position to be able to neutralize the next or deal with the next person Right, so that's more like with Silat. It's like I'll someone someone's coming to attack me. I'll do whatever, whatever, sweep them. Now they're on the floor, and then Silat would be I hold them in a hold that like with my legs while my hands are still good and active and ready. And then wait for the next person to come handle that. Put that person on the ground, break his arm instead of holding him, or the dude that I was just holding in the lock. I just break his arm, then go hold the next guy, kind of thing. You know, <laughs> so, so it's very complex. I, I just imagine in my head, like, uh, like, have you ever watched that movie Ong Bak? Yeah, that's what doubt. I'm imagining in my head. I don't know if I'm completely off in that, but he's more Thai, he, he does more yeah. Baran. That's to do with the rap, right? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, that's not how Sila looks, that's more like movie ish, but his, his style, I think, is more more structured after Moy Baran, which is like the precursor to Muay Thai. It's like right. Muay Thai came from Moy Baran. Okay, okay. Right. So I'm way off what I'm imagining. It's all right. They all from like, they're from that general, I don't want to sound ignorant. I don't want to sound ignorant, but. So that area of the world. <laughs> yeah, that area yeah, of the world. Yeah, yeah. We'll come yeah. And then but, uh, finally, yeah. Jeet Kune Do, which you've said is your main inspiration, as you said before, watching yeah. Bruce Lee movies as a kid. And then yeah. going full circle, and then yeah. So you know, I was already hyped when I was when my mom told me that I was gonna she was gonna put me in Bruce Lee classes and stuff. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but yeah, that's another thing where it's 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 tricky. You could find people that are not good at what they do, or they just interested in your money, or you find people that know what they do. And I was fortunate that wherever I trained, well, I feel like I had a good eye for it. So I would, I, I knew where to go and I knew where not to go, but wherever I trained my, my instructors and my coaches, my seafoods, my, my crews, everyone, they, they were always knowledgeable, very knowledgeable. And they knew what they were doing, thankfully. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. They have, um, the Jeet Kune Do scene is very, it's not small, but the main, like the top instructors in the world are known, right? So my style of JKD came from Sifu Cast Magda, right? So they have all these different love, like different Sifus that have their own style of JKD with this guy does, does it this way. And he trains this, this stuff over the other stuff, like, you know, like style based. So my style came from Cast Magda 
And um, you know, uh, it was, it's not that like it's, I don't know about eye opening, but it teaches you a lot and it puts like, it, it, it renders a lot of things Mm. It, it neutralizes a lot of moves that you would think would work in reality like it was meant to it was meant for street fighting right so if somebody right. throws like like a like a punch right let's just say like a punch like j kundo is the way of intercepting fist is what it means right so intercepting fist means we both throw punches and, we, and we're like this right yeah, so yeah. so a boxer would tell you oh you have to you have Probably to parry yeah, yeah exactly yeah. you got to parry right boom same side if the punch coming on this side you got to parry from the outside of the elbow to the inside right like, you would parry me that way yeah right Ji Kune Do like since it comes from Wing Chun Kung Fu you can parry this way you can parry this way when you intercept a fist they have techniques to bring someone in grabs all these grabs the this is a grab like you see how I'm grabbing and I'm pulling but I can still yeah, punch yeah. You know, it's very, it's like it's more um, like natural flow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like water. That's what everybody like. Water, likes like as Bruce Lee would say. <laughs> yeah, Be like water. Exactly. But yeah, yeah. I, lo I loved it. I try to incorporate all the styles that I've, I've done in the way that I fight, even if it's like, like wrestling. I'll, I'll try to bring my wrestling into my kickboxing. Like if I'm doing the clinch, like let's say, like in wrestling, you have to put a lot of weight down on someone's like neck and head. Like yeah. This. So I do the same thing when I do clinch. I'll clinch up. I'll drop my weight. A lot of people fall down to the ground when I do it, you know. But that's just one example. I try to not necessarily mold everything together into one style, but I try to keep keep myself styleless, like not yeah. a specific style. But I have certain tools that I know I can rely on. And keep the things that work, and discard the things that don't, which is exactly. very much like treat kondo exactly like, yeah Makes sense. i would say help help to open my eyes to not the physical side of martial arts but to like the the thinking side like the ph philosophy which is which is in part like a lot of what was gone into making jeet Kune Do. like i don't know if you're familiar with the book the tao you know the tao um can't it's, say i'm no that's fine it's so uh, it's like a chinese uh like uh, what do you call it um buddhist book like a like it basically just teaches you the way, right? Like philosophy, right? right. right? So when, when Bruce Lee made Jeet Kune Do, he came out with the Tao of JKD, right? right Where yeah. he goes into talking about the philosophies of, of fighting and like um, not necessarily you should do something this way, but you the goal is to get this done and how you can go about thinking for yourself on how to get there, basically. That, that's really rough, really rough. But the, something as complex as that would take a while to really like, you know, like uh, explain well. But it's, it's more so like Jeet Kune Do is philosophy. It's okay. not necessarily a style. Yeah, it has stylist, stylistic movements that you can associate with JKD, but it's more so a philosophy. Like you want to be able to handle the situation then have a specific set of tools to handle it. Like your 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 whole body is the tool. That you make your tools as you go. Then I'm only have these three tools that I can only use in case of these three circumstances. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, it's very philo philosophical. It's like quantum physics. It's like <laughs> grasp. You could kind of grasp it, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no, I get you. I think you've done a good job of explaining it because i i, I think yeah. i've understood it yeah. <laughs> um yeah it's a great book i would recommend it tower of jkd I'll, I'll i'll give it a read i, I like stuff like that i, I read um uh, at the beginning of this the lockdown over here um i ordered um the art of war by sun Tzu. Ah, i like that book too yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah. but I, the thing i like about like a lot of these books is that like when i was reading the art of war you can apply it to anything Mm -hmm. And it's similar to what you're saying is that like you you learn it from one angle but you can apply it somewhere else like so Everything. easily yeah, yeah, yeah. You there's you like, what like certain laws exactly. almost but they're but they're in a way that they're not spe specific like they they can apply to many different yeah different circumstances exactly like, right 
And um, you recently fought in uh, Madison Square Garden as well. So what was that like? Yeah, that was that was fun. Um, I, I had a little too much to drink after that just because of Madison <laughs> Square Garden. But, um, yo, that was really fun. Um, She's clocking you like, what? You drunk too much? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was before you were born. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the garden was cool. I fought in the Hulu Theater. That's where uh, it was the same place that all the greats fight at when they go there. And, like, like Ali fought there. Ali Frazier. Um, One yeah. and two. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that was cool being able to say that I've been there too and I, I fought there too. But um, I don't really, when I'm fighting, I try not to really think about where I'm at or who's in the crowd or, you know, like all that is for after when I'm done fighting and I'm like, yo, it's time to get lit for the drinks. Yeah. yeah. That's really the only time for that. You've got a zone another time, but it must be cool, like retrospectively looking like all these great fights have occurred. It's like the mecca of like combat sports and yeah. you've fought in that same place, which must be a cool feeling. Crazy. Yeah. But the first thing, like when I walked out, like, I remember looking at the crowd and looking at the spotlights, and I was like, damn, this is a lot, a lot of people. I think I fought in front of, like, 5,000 people in my Madison Square Garden fight. Wow. So, it's just like, yeah, it was just like, wow. Like, I hear all these people screaming. And one thing about New York fights is the crowd will scream a lot of things. Like, you get a lot of things screamed at you, whether it's, like, like kick him below the belt, like, <laughs> bite his ear off, like... You get you get a whole lot because a lot of the people in the crowd are already drunk. <laughs> well, maybe Tyson heard that as well when he bit Vander's ear off. That's, that's what he, he did. I was like, that's <laughs> what he did. Blame it on the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what is um? So obviously, you're what five fights in? Three fights, two losses. Five. Yeah, five. Hoping to get out soon. Um, in Alabama, I think you were saying. Uh no. No. Oh no! In Atlanta. Atlanta, sorry, sorry, Atlanta, my bad. Is uh, is that coming to like fruition? What what's going on with that? Yeah, we're getting ready. We're going to looking at fight camp. I think the, uh, I think we're looking at like four months from now. Okay. Four months from now, I don't know. I don't know too much of the details. Once I get matched up, then it's really like they yeah. tell you tell you more about it. That's when you really get into that mode. Mm-hmm. But right now, it's more so just getting more back into shape. And you yeah. know, like, uh, knocking off the ring rust. I think the last, yeah, the last time I fought was like twenty. It was like twenty twenty now. Yeah, so twenty eighteen was the last time I fought at the end of twenty. How come so long out? Obviously, this year being COVID, but what, what about yeah. last year? I was I was ready. I was well because my little my little girlfriend came, <laughs> right? But <laughs> but um. Yeah, so I just had to take a little break, you know, get home life right. Yeah. You know, show my baby good. But, um, yeah, so I'm trying to get back. I'm getting back. I'm just looking looking for a matchup right now. Just trying to get in the mindset. Once I get my person, then that's usually when the flip switch. Because then it's like, yo, someone right now got your face in their mind. And they're, they're thinking about punching your teeth out. You got to think the same. <laughs> yeah, so you got to. You gotta right now I might be playing some video games, but you gotta get up. Get your butt up. It don't matter if it's twelve o'clock, one o'clock, you need to get up and go. Go on the track. Go go do some push ups. Go do something while the commercials running. Like, you know, like that's when yeah. it starts. The animal instinct starts to come in or oh I gotta I gotta mess someone up. Like I gotta I gotta see someone. Definitely. And yeah. then what what is the what is the goal? Is it like to make a the one championship or is it to be in K one or so the goal is I wanna I wanna be I wanna be recognized, I wanna be known, and I wanna be like I want people to be able to talk about me like like damn, Arvir had that crazy style, or yo, Arvir was doing this, that, yo, he goes in the in the Hall of Fame because Arvir came through, man, unorthodox and he did this, that, and the third, and he he beat this person, beat that person. I'm not looking for a long time, but I'm looking for a good time because I like I like my teeth where they are, you know. I like yeah. to be able to, to jump. I like to be able to lift my baby up and move my head, you yeah, know. Yeah. 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 Me, sorry, this sorry. Um, I I did have a question. Would it be easier for you to transition from, um, like 
the the style that you are now to boxing rather than uh, like an MMA like one championship just because of the um, the depth of like the ground game because it's from when we were from before we spoke it sounded more like you were a stand up fighter but then mm-hmm. obviously while we're speaking of like obviously you, you said you you know you're wrestling you've made mm-hmm. people chop out you've done some jujitsu and stuff. Mm-hmm. So then maybe obviously because you do have knowledge in that it's it would be easier to you, for you to go into um like like a promotion like one or or UFC. Yeah. But like in my mind beforehand, would it be easier for a kickboxer to go into boxing for a career or into like the UFC for a career is what I had in my mind before. That's a really good question. I feel like the majority of fighters are gonna tell you that a kickboxer has no business being in a boxing match. But I, from my personal experience, and just just not putting my limitations on myself, any limitations on myself, I find that boxing is a lot easier than kickboxing. But I also train boxing with pure boxers. So I'll go to the gym to go do just pure boxing, hit just boxing pad work with my coach or fight just boxers, all the boxers in the gym that are preparing for fights. Yeah. So that is something that I'm looking for as I'm also, I'm also in works trying to get boxing fights in too. When you ask me that, I also like my goal really to go pro in the, I want to do the trifecta. I want to do boxing, kickboxing, and MMA. I want to do all three awesome. of those go pro. And then maybe it may just maybe the, this is where a little bit of the limitation comes in is maybe even to go in jujitsu and maybe even wrestling. But that's the maybe. That's I gotta. That's a lot. Now I'm putting a lot on my plate. Yeah. But, <laughs> but if it's stand up, exactly. If I'm stand up, I can do all stand up things because yeah. I got my hands. If I can only use my hands, I would still rock some of just my hands. If I got hands and feet, I'm even more of a problem. If his hands, feet, ground, I'm even more of a problem. You know, you got. But then, if more- you have a wrestling background as well, like surely you can prevent people from taking you to the ground in a, in an MMA setting. And then you can just do your stand-up thing because that's your, what, you what you're best at. Smart. You are very smart. Thank you. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly the goal, is to train the wrestling so that way no one can take me down and I can just head kick everybody all day. Yeah, and to be yeah. fair, that seems to be the most exciting um, style that ends up being popular in, yeah. like, in MMA as well. That's like, still- that's an unfortunate style too, because now you have to, now you put yourself in more risk. It's not unfortunate. It's a give or take. It really is how crazy you are, but it's more risk associated with that style. Like, yeah. like Israel, when he gets tagged up, like when he fought Kevin Gastelum, he, he was swollen because he fights a lot with his hands down. Yeah. His, yeah. His, you know, that's the drawback, but it's live by the sword, die by the sword. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I had the similar sort of um, like logic in my mind that surely if you're a kickboxer, um, it would be easier to become a boxer lucratively than go into MMA simply just because like the amount of groundwork there is, the like yeah. amount of different sort of ground styles there are, it yeah. would be just so much to learn compared to if you're already a kickboxer, you've sort of got half of the boxing style down. Do you know what I mean? You just got to get rid get used to not throwing your kicks essentially that, that's a misconception though that that is the reason why people will tell kickboxers that they have no business being with boxers because right. the kickboxing style especially muay thai is a lot of hands up like this both hands up yeah, feet yeah. Stomping, you're doing the march you know and boxers if you look at a boxer they have very wide lengthy stances mm-hmm. a lot of them will put their shoulder in front yeah, you know yeah. the styles are different but I feel like if you look at it the right way, as in back to what we were saying about Jeet Kune Do and how you need, you need to be able to deal with the problems as they come to you, as opposed to, oh, here's my trusty dusty tool that I always pull out in times of, in times of uncertainty, you know, because you'll get a lot farther if you know how to deal with problems as they come to you than only be ready for specific certain problems. I feel like it translates between all fighting sports because at the end of the day, you're still just fighting. Yeah, yeah, it's, definitely. It's, the main goal is to hurt you rather than not get hurt. Exactly. It's yeah. sweet science. Sweet it's science. Like, it's literally a science. It's a it. mental science. It's a physical science. It's beautiful. It's beauty. It's like 
it's like an art. I like to look at it like an art form. It's an art form. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. It is beautiful. When it comes off and you see someone like Floyd doing his thing in boxing, or you see someone like John Jones mm-hmm. in, in the octagon, you see Khabib just mauling people. It, yeah. you, can only just, you can only just stand there and appreciate it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, so we'll finish off with some quick fire questions. Mm. Um, a few of these to go through. So um, I have a feeling I'm going to know the answer to this because I have a feeling uh, she's mm. in your hands. But what are you most proud of? Most proud of is this baby right here because she does, she finds ways to amaze me every day. Every day, she's going to say something, do something, show some sign of intelligence that just blows my mind every day. But uh, not including my family members or like anything like that. I think the most proudest thing I would have to say is me never giving up in my fighting career because I've done, I've taken a lot of hits. I've been put down really bad. I've, I've lost fights, I've won fights. I've, I've been robbed in fights. I've gone to national tournaments and lost in front of thousands of people. I've done, done a lot. I've done got my, my nose broken in front of my mother. She told me to stop fighting. I, and even through everything, I, I'm most proud that I had to stop because this is like a true love of mine. It's, and this is what like my job is. Like I, I teach people how to fight. I teach people physical fitness. Like I mm-hmm. teach people health and stuff. And I feel like it's something that I could never see myself stopping. Even when, even if I were to have like no legs tomorrow, God forbid, like I would still be in the gym throwing punches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like I feel like that's nothing that I can ever give up. And I'm, I'm proud of myself that I haven't given it up, but I feel like I can never give it up. Definitely. Um, yeah. What is your favorite memory of your career so far? Oh man, favorite memory. I would have to say it was when I broke my nose because when I broke it, my my sensei was in my karate school. So my sensei, he's called Shihan. So Shihan is like the the name given to like the owner of the the gym. They call him Shihan, right? Like the highest black belt in the gym. Wow. And so Shihan was like he he saw me break my nose, and then my mom comes running into the onto the floor and she's holding me like this, like a baby. She's like, oh my god. And then I remember Shihan was telling me, he was like, no, nah, it's not broken. Yeah. Go, go, go over and sit down. Go back and sit down. Finish class. It's not broken. Like, you just put some ice on it. And then I ended up finishing class. I went over, I sat down, I waited and all of that. And meanwhile, my nose is broken in three places from the tip to the joint to the bone on top. Like, and, and then after class, like during class, I was like, okay, Shihan, I'm gonna go. Like, this is the mental training. This is the mental training and the iron body, right? Yeah. So go sit down, finish, like, finish off the, the last half hour of class or whatever. And then I came out and I went outside. Like, I remember I told everyone, bye, 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 whatever. Like, see you later, Shihan. Like, went outside of the gym. And I told my mom, mom, I gotta go to the hospital. <laughs> it's cold now. It's broken. It's broken. I heard it crack. And then and then we went to the hospital and we took an x-ray and it was shattered. Like a shatter is considered anything two breaks or more. And I had three breaks. So it was considered a shatter. I had a shattered nose. And that's just one of my favorite memories because it's like it's like my Shihan, he told me, you're okay. Yeah, and yeah. Because he told me I was okay. And I had that mental, that mental toughness of I always have to be okay. I was okay. I yeah. was bleeding through my nose. My nose wasn't bleeding too much. Like I was, I was fine. I still was doing exercise. Like, but I just know my body. And then I got out, went to a doctor. And then when they told me my nose was broken in three places, I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I'm just crazy. I was just like, yeah, I broke my nose and I wasn't even like, like you were too bothered. A little, a little baby about it, you know. Yeah, I wasn't bothered. But that, yeah, that was my favorite in my career. What yeah. are you most looking forward to? I would say, 
I would say grabbing a belt and putting a holding a belt, you know, that's like a stereotypical answer. Like, yeah, that's that interests me. But what I'm really looking most forward to is is not the praise, but but when when the acknowledgement. Because I put a lot of hard work into what I do and I like when I'm acknowledged for it. Yeah. I like when when like the knockout video that you had that, that you were talking about earlier. Like in my fight in the garden, which happened before that, mm-hmm. I remember I kicked my opponent maybe like three, four times in the head. And the whole time I was like, why isn't he why isn't he hitting the deck? Why isn't he getting knocked out? Like I was so frustrated. Like yeah. he needs to be knocked out. I kick I'm kicking him with my leg in his face and he's not doing anything. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I remember after that fight, I drilled the head kick with my left leg over and over. Oh hundreds of thousands of times drill 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 hit with the shin before when i was in the garden i only hit with the foot hit with the shin hit with the shin hit with the shin keep going hit, hit the shin hit the shin I must have hit the bag so many times my shin bleed my, yeah. my shin bleed from hitting the bag so much the skin comes off and then went into that fight mm-hmm. it just came out i didn't even tell myself to throw the kick it was just all instinct yeah just blow it out blow it out do the kick hit him right with the shin it wasn't a hard kick it literally just because I hit with the shin is why it was so devastating. If I had hit him with the foot, he probably would have shook, shook it off like the last guy. But because I hit him with the shin, uh, that was what you saw in the video. It just played out the way it did. So yeah. that one, that Ooh, one okay, made yeah. me because I, I remember, I remember hours. I would sit down and throw the same head kick for hours, and hours, and hours on end, four or five hours just in front of the same bag. And then when I got that head kick, it was like, yeah, like, I feel good. Yeah, because I got the knockout, but because I've trained that shit so hard, so long. And, like, I don't know if you saw in my video, in, like, the full video, I threw my mouthpiece out the ground. I'm, like, roaring like a lion. I'm like, ah. <laughs> looking back, I wish I didn't do that, but I know that I did that because I trained that one head kick so hard. I trained it so many times, thousands of times. And when I landed it, it was like, it was like, yo, like I did it. Like I finally did it. Like I, I trained this one head kick and last time I didn't knock him out with it. But this time, because I trained it so hard, I knocked him out cold. And they actually had to, they had to, that, that dude didn't get back up from that shot. They had to take him to the hospital, roll him onto a stretcher, stretch him for the ambulance. Take him from the amb- he didn't wake up till he got to the hospital. He stayed wow. asleep the whole time, lost three T, broke his jaw, all that. I'm not proud of that, but but your hard but work that, paid off. Yeah, my hard work definitely paid off. Like that that was just testament to I really hit him with my shin, which I trained so hard and so long for to do. Yeah. yeah. Um next one is what is your biggest motivation? Motivation, I would feel like it's myself because I know where my flaws lie. And I know what I need to work on. And I know that I'm my biggest enemy is myself. And that, that's with anybody, you're your own biggest enemy. You put limitations on yourself. Like, oh, I don't think I can do this, or I can't do this because I have bad knees, or I can't do this because pop pop my shoulder, or when I was younger, this happened to me, and you know, so on and so forth. So I feel like when I, like again, with the head kick, I was my biggest motivation. I knew that my head kick was weak. Like, yeah. how you, like, it's embarrassing when you kick someone in the head flush four times and they don't knock out. Like, that maybe it's not embarrassing to the average person, but to me, that's embarrassing. It's like, like yeah. I took that back and I was like, yo, what? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, damn, I didn't know I was that weak. Like, I didn't know my head kick wasn't that good. So, yeah. like, I, I went back, I trained it because I know that I know my own potential and I know what's holding me back. And I, I conquered that hill, conquered that mountain. And then, like, you know, that's just a testament that anything can happen. And if you look at the dude I knocked out, that was the 180 pound. He was a bodybuilder. His muscles, like, <laughs> put my muscles to shame. Yeah. Shame, you know? That was a very big hill that I climbed up and I kicked that hill's ass. And I was, I was like, that was big motivation for me. Big, big, big motivation for me. And that really showed me that, you know, like all the barriers in life, you put them up up here. 
Once yeah. you take them down a pair, they, they fall down in real life. That's it. Before that fight, everybody was saying, yo, this little Indian kid, he's going to die. Yo, this, this big black dude is going to kill this little Indian kid. Why would they do that? Yeah, Why would yeah. they put this kid in the ring with this? That dude was like 32 years old. I was 20 at the time, 21. You know, they were like, oh, this is this is not even fair. And then the whole time, I was like, yo, he don't even know what's about to hit him. <laughs> I did what I did. And then I'm here talking to you like that I knocked him out. He didn't knock me out. He almost knocked me out that fight, too. He uh, hit me. I turned the whole 180, turned around <laughs> with a punch. I do. He almost knocked me out. And that's my bro, too. His name is um, name is Bond. We actually talk a lot. He's very knowledgeable in health and wellness and stuff. That's my homie. But, uh, but yeah, that was a good fight. That was a good fight. Um, how did you celebrate your first major success or first victory? That well, that one was at the garden where I drank too much and uh, I <laughs> drank too much and then I got liver damage. <laughs> oh, that much. <laughs> that much, yeah, that much. <laughs> wow, okay, okay. Yeah, well, but... swiftly move on. <laughs> yeah. No, no, we can stay on it real quick, but um, I think that's just tradition for, for fighters. Is yeah. when, well, at least over here, is when we finish fighting, that's when break out the alcohol. That's when it comes out. But it's not a healthy tradition, especially since you're cutting water weight and you're hydrated, dehydrated and that stuff. You got to rehydrate it with water. But yeah. Um, but yeah, that's really how we celebrate over here. We just get lit. Get get lit. lit. <laughs> fair play, fair play. Um, and then last two. So. Yeah. What is your definition of success? Success is really in the mind. Like, because, you know, some people, to them, success is becoming a janitor in, in a first world country. That's, that's a success for some people. For other people, that's a defeat. Success for some people is, like, a lot of the time it's, it's subjective, but it's really just whatever makes you feel successful or what makes you feel content so, so what is that for you for me personally it's just happiness if i'm if i can be old and i can be happy i don't have i have a smile on my face every morning i can you know i can move freely you know like i can do this i can you know touch my baby you know whatever and that's really that's really success to me it's people that are like that are older, like 40, 50, that are 60, that are struggling, like stressing about bills, about about where am I gonna go on my vacation? When, like, what am I gonna look like if, if this thing happens to me? Like, oh, I have to keep my image up. Oh, I need to, you know, I feel like if I'm old and I'm happy and I'm content, then I'm successful. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. And um, last one, because it is the Culture Cast podcast. How do you think your culture has affected you in your journey thus far? I think the mindset, big thing is the mindset. Like, I don't know. I feel like, like just growing up in Richmond Hill, I don't know. Well, growing up in Richmond Hill, the Punjabi kids over there was always like, it was tough. It was tough. It doesn't matter if you were in the basketball, basketball court, if you was, like, you know, just walking around, like, like all my older, like my older brothers, like that were Punjabi, they were like, like, oh, like if we were walking around and some kid commented on his turban, that kid was gonna get his ass beat. <laughs> beat. Like, like type of thing where they take their cutter off, put it right here and punch it back. Like they was real tough, 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 tough. And I feel uh. like that is what helped me, like one, helped me to, to accept the training mentality and like the hard like conditioning mentality of like Shotokan or, or any of the fighting game. And it also at the same time helped me to develop that, that, that like, um, that habit where it's, oh, he, t he touched me, you know, he did what to me, now let me do that back to him. And that, I feel like that type of mentality is, is good to have when you're fighting because like you don't want to get hit as many times as you can. You know, the main goal is not to get hit, it's to give hits. And yeah, some people yeah. will stand there and just take the hits 
and be like, oh yeah, I could take that hit, boom. Oh, that's what's up, I could take that hit, boom. But with me, it, oh, you hit me? Now let me touch you, now let me touch you back, you know, type yeah. of thing. I like guess like, and, and growing up, it also helped me to like stand up for myself because I, I always see like my older brothers, you know, they would always, you know, they would stand up for themselves and they would stand up for me when I needed it. So growing up, I, I always try to stand up for my friends when they needed it, stand up for myself when I know I, like I need to stand up for myself and not necessarily like go around beating people up, but or like the first person that looks at me crazy, beat them up. But, you know, like whenever the, the time calls for it, you know, a lot of times, like you need to stand up for yourself. And it, it's not okay to let certain things go because then a lot of the times people will continue to, to belittle you or you know, just whatever comes with the whole bullying, oppression, oppression stuff. And I, um, like, I'm very grateful that I grew up in the area that I did because with uh, surrounded by all the culture of of Sikh, Sikhism and like Punjabi people, like, growing up telling me, yo, back in the pen on the farm, we used to do this, like going there and seeing that, that type of thing, like that, that's a real motivation for me is like where your ancestors come from. Like, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, not maybe not a lot of people think like this, but if I were like a thousand years old and I looked at my, my great, 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 great grandkid, I would want to be happy, you know, like I want to look at them and be proud. So I, I try to live a life and do certain things that, you know, I know make my ancestors proud. That's a really good way of looking at it, to be fair. Very thank good way of looking at it. Yeah, um, yeah and that's, that's all the quick fire questions. So thank you again for your time, um, yeah. especially with the time difference and sorting everything out. Um, thank you. I know it's a little late for you over there. No, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's, it's touching. Uh, it's like quarter past 11, so not too bad. All not right. too bad. Um, yeah, I'm going to have all your socials and stuff um, on screen and in the links in the uh, description. Mainly Instagram, you said you use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mainly. Just pass the juice you. with two underscores at the end. Yeah, I can send you my Facebook. Um, if you want, I can send you the LinkedIn. Yeah, I can send you that stuff. Or whatever you want me to send you. I just don't use Twitter, really. Yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, I'll grab all of that after this and we'll put all the links in the description. And um, yeah. Wicked. Right. Cool. Sweet. So I'm gonna just show my baby. I know one day she's gonna be looking at this. <laughs> oh my baby, you fall asleep on your dad. Oh my gosh, so cute. All right. <laughs> <laughs>